Well, hello everybody. This is kind of exciting to be here in person. It's been uh, a very interesting year last year, so I think this is the first time that I've been in such a, uh, a big group. So thanks for coming along. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Ability School Engagement Partnership Program. And I'm going to actually pick up on the three themes that Michael just uh, talked about, which was driving collaboration, creating community and building trust. So thanks for, uh, for saying that, um, Michael. That's really hooked into what I'm going to be talking about. So to get you oriented to the Ability School Engagement Program, um, I just want to introduce you to this amazing woman. And you can go and have a look at her TED Talk if you'd like. Her name's Rita Pearson. And she said this, every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Wow. That's exactly what we were trying to do in the Ability School Engagement Program. What we were trying to do was to build that champion for that child. And I'm going to just give you a few um, examples of what we did. What we um, started with was the idea of a partnership. And I know that many of you here um, have either worked in partnerships or you think partnerships are a good idea. And I would agree with you. Oops. Okay, so let's go back to 2009. And we have our esteemed president here, uh, Ian Stewart. And Ian was actually... It was actually, I think you were the deputy commissioner at the time and soon to become the commissioner of police. But this is a, um, a picture representing the tensions that the police felt when they were walking inside the gates of some high schools in some very disadvantaged areas across Queensland. The relationship wasn't great. In fact, what the teachers were saying and the police were saying is that the police would get uh, the leftovers of lunch boxes thrown um, at them as they were walking through the school grounds. Not great. So what the police and the schools wanted to do was to form a productive partnership. So at the time, and it's actually still the case, um, there is a what we would call a, a regulatory pyramid for how we deal with kids that are truanting from school. So this is a what we call the regulatory pyramid, and if my zapper does work, see it's probably gone on sleep mode for the whole of 2020. Um, but basically what we want to do is we want to focus our energies on using very little to uh, convince parents and children to have the kids go back to school. What we don't want to do is we actually don't want to escalate that through the regulatory pyramid because in actual fact the law says that parents can be held accountable and can be prosecuted and fined for their kids not going to school. Now fining a parent, this has actually come out of the Courier Mail a few years ago, fining a parent for their kids going to school, what do you think that's going to achieve? Not a lot. Um, and so what we want to do is to actually foster what we'd call willing compliance, building the trust between the schools and the police and the kids and the parents, building them as a team to um, avoid that, um, that kind of response. So one of the themes that I hope we can talk about today is how you build partnerships and to build partnerships you really need shared problems and so that you can share in the response. So it was obvious to the schools, they have the responsibility for the kids that are skipping school. Um, in actual fact, the, the police in the early days, they really struggled with this. You know, they said, well, why are we participating in something? This is the school's responsibility. So we looked at the data, right? I'm an evidence-based experimental criminologist. We look at data all the time. And what we found was that there was a 98% overlap between the kids that were skipping schools and the families that were known to police. Now, I'm not saying that these are families that are that offenders necessarily. They were known to the police. Maybe they were known to the police as victims, victims of domestic violence, for example. That was incredibly powerful 
because what it said is that these families and these kids are known to both the police and the schools and they're sharing in some of the problem. So that was an, an, an aha moment for us to get to, to that step. The other part of the problem is that these kids are actually costing the government an enormous amount of money. In fact, I had a PhD student that looked at the cost of truanting in terms of welfare uh, cash transfers later in life. In actual fact, it was 4.5 times more any level of truanting, and I'm not talking about just you know really high-end truanting costing the government a lot of money. I'm actually talking about any level of truanting. So any level of truanting was uh, related to um, uh, th these kinds of costs to governments. So, so we uh, set out to create a police schools partnership. Now we call it third party policing, that's not as important. The most important thing is two part components to this partnership. Obviously the, there is a dyad partnership between the police and schools, but the second component was what we call the legal lever. So the schools had that, um, that responsibility to deal with truanting kids. So rather than the police being reactive and uh, to, to the problem, we wanted the police to work with the schools in terms of prevention. And the quote from Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. How many times have you heard that? But it's true. So uh, we set out to um, create the Ability School Engagement Program. And at the centre of this is a family group conference. Now, a lot of you have probably heard about family group conferences before, but we actually infused into this dialogue some very unique component parts. And the, the, the foundation of it is communicating in a procedurally, what we call a procedurally just way, building trust, giving voice to the young person, uh, and creating an understanding for the parent about their legal responsibilities. Very simple, 45 minute conference. The cost is really, really low. You know, as I said, a, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so what, we, what did we do? So we did actually run a randomised control exper experiment, which I won't bore you with, um, but you know, I have to give you at least a little bit of a, um, some of the results here. So this is a result that shows that um, when parents have a better understanding of the laws, which is part of what we did within that family group conference, then it actually moderates, which means that it influences the child's willingness to attend school. That's huge. It's not very, it was not very much that we did. Very, very low level. But if you can increase the attendance of these kids going to school, you have a huge lot of downstream benefits. So here's some of the main results, of which I will show you no more graphs. The first thing is that it lengthened what we call the time to failure for a recidivist official offending. It meant that there was longer time between any kind of offending that these kids or the families that were involved in offending um, experienced. It lengthened the time to failure for repeat school absences. So rather than them skipping every nine days, it might have extended it out to like every 21 days. That gives you a, a foothold into helping these kids. It increases self-reported willingness to go to school. Now, the kicker here is that we track these kids six months po post randomization, one year post randomization, two years post randomization, and the results held. These kids stayed at school more. Um, it also increased parental understanding of the law, and as I showed you that graph, it influenced the willingness of these kids to go to school. And importantly, it reduced antisocial behaviour and again sustained over time. So if we come back to Rita Pearson's uh, uh, statement, what we were trying to do within ASAP, within this partnership, was to create that champion for that young person. And I, I really hope today maybe we could create a youth futures lab. That's my mission from today's talk. Great, thank you very much.
Lorraine, you, yours was a fabulous example of how partnership can work with a shared goal, or even a shared problem. Does it work well with multi-agency partnerships or is that a recipe for disaster? Okay, so I think that the um, there is a sweet spot and I think that if you've got too many partners, it does uh, go to the lowest common denominator and it's very difficult to get everyone um, singing off the same hymn sheet and actually moving forward. So where is that sweet spot? Um, is it a dyad partnership? Is it three or four? And, you know, clearly the more complex the problem, the, the more complex you need partners. But I just do caution people to not um, go full on into grabbing every every partner that they think has might have a, a, a stake in the problem and really concentrate those partnerships so that they actually become really, really functioning partnerships so people don't get distracted. Do you know it's the right partner early on or, or is that the risk factor we talk about? Yeah. So if the partners actually have a clear mandate that this is a problem then and it is a truly a shared problem, then that's that's half the battle. Uh, I think if you, um, you know, we did have some issues about convincing the police that kids skipping school was part of their their problem as well. But you know, I think that when 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 that's obvious and people can see that it's actually going to benefit them and their organisational unit and their agency, then you know that that part of the battle is um, is over. So that's interesting because what you're saying is right at the beginning, there may not have been that shared goal. You had to convince the other partner, police, that that prevention was better than the reaction. Correct. And I think that that's, that's a really important message to take home that, you know, it's, it, there's got to be a clear um, stake. You know, there's people have to... F the agencies, the people working in the agencies need to feel that, they, that this problem is actually real and something that is a priority for their agency. Does it have to be a shared problem to have a good partnership? I, I think it does. It, it really does. And if that if that shared problem isn't obvious, it's very difficult to bring the partners along. That, that's really interesting for people in the room because then is the starting point for a partnership to to look at the problems you're facing and who may have a similar problem. And who has a real stake in that problem. Okay, Michael, yeah, just um, a couple of things in terms of building trust. The other components are treating people in the partnership with dignity and respect and the way that people interact with each other and interact with each other with, with um, respect is fundamental to that and also giving everybody voice so that no one's dominating the, the partnership. Can I ask you, Lorraine, while you're there, on this issue of... You had to win the police over that prevention was better than the problem at the end. How do you do that when you're looking for a partner and it's you're being proactive rather than reactive? How difficult is that? And are you looking for something different in a partner in that case? Sure, and I could really take a very long time to talk about... Not you too know, long. Which is not... <laughs> It's, and I, so, but I won't. Um, but look, it, it's it is very difficult when people are working on the front line. They're really, really busy. You know, all they're doing is being able to put out the fires. And in the case of police, going from call to call, it's very, very, very difficult to carve out time for prevention. And I know that Ian spent his entire career uh, working on trying to carve out that kind of time. And I'm sure all of you do as well. But it is in the end, it is cheaper. Um, to uh, to quarantine some of the time around prevention, and that's really hard to do.